of all the dams, power plants, bridges, water systems, and other structures that I built in 60 years of contracting, if I had to be remembered for any single project, I'd like it to be the Victoria Dam and Hydroelectric Development in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. So reads the autobiography of Harry Steele Price Sr., principal of Price Brothers, the internationally recognized contracting firm that invested in and built Victoria Dam. Price Brothers may have built it, but the idea for Victoria Dam came from Frank and Al Spees of Downstate Michigan. In 1925, they were hunting along the Ontonagon River near Rockland and came upon the gorge at Glen Falls. Their experience building hydros in Michigan's Lower Peninsula told them they'd found a good spot for a new dam. They were not the first to see potential in the area. Adventurers and fortune hunters had been visiting the Ontonagon River Valley since antiquity. One treasure sought by early explorers was a large mass of copper that lay on the north side of what is now Victoria Reservoir. The boulder was sacred to the Chippewa natives, who told French Jesuits about it in the mid-1600s. In 1843, the fabled Ontonagon boulder was removed from the riverbank and eventually came to rest in the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. By the time the Spees brothers arrived on the scene, there was already a small dam above Glen Falls called Hooper's Dam. It diverted water to produce energy for the Victoria Mining Company, which had ceased operations some years earlier. The Spees brothers' intuition and timing were right on target for the mid-1920s. Other copper mining and forest products companies in the area needed more power in order to develop and expand. But it took four years of collecting data and lining up investors before the first ground was broken on the project. In October 1929, just ahead of the great stock market crash, work began. It would be a remarkable feat of engineering, built under primitive conditions, complicated by a difficult location, and beset by extremes of weather. Upper Peninsula Power Company has been the steward of Victoria Dam since 1947. That year, UPCO was formed through the merger of three smaller utilities, including Copper District Power Company, the original owner of the dam. The many preservation and improvement projects at Victoria over the last half century bear witness to UPCO's ongoing commitment to clean, domestic, and renewable sources of energy. Charlie Johnson of Rockland had a long career at Victoria, retiring as superintendent in 1980 after 43 years of service. But his association with Victoria goes back even further. Well, my first experience with the pipeline was when I was 14 years old. I was hired as a water boy. This was to carry water to the, there was 40 men, maybe 50 working on the pipe, pouring the concrete and the sills and saddles. And on a hot day like today, I really kept going. On a nice cool day, I was able to take it pretty easy, but uh, I worked 10 hours a day, 40 cents an hour for that whole summer. As much construction material as possible was taken from the surrounding area. All lumber, except for the Redwood Pipeline, was cut from the adjacent property. Concrete was made at site using crushed mine rock and sand from the beach at Ontonagon. Workmen toiled for 14 months, and in January 1931, Victoria Hydro was placed in commercial operation. The dam was built in the multiple arched buttress style common in the 1920s and 30s to conserve materials. Gravity moved water downhill from the reservoir to the powerhouse through a 6,050-foot-long redwood penstock, 10 feet in diameter and held together with 72,000 iron bands. It was supported by concrete saddles every 10 feet along its length. If the wood staves in the original penstock were placed end to end, they would stretch 84 miles. Water flowed through the penstock at the rate of 830 cubic feet per second. To put that into perspective, in an average year, it would fill nearly 14 million Olympic-sized swimming pools. A 100-foot-high surge tank at the end of the penstock protected the generators from pressure changes. 
Finally, tucked down below the hill lay the powerhouse, a classic brick structure whose simple exterior belied the activity within. The powerhouse was where the real work was done, where the force of falling water generated electricity. Then, as now, Victoria generated about 70 million kilowatt hours in an average water year. Today, that's enough electricity to meet the needs of nearly 12,000 households. But time and the elements were not kind to Victoria. Over the years, the harsh climate of northern Michigan and the stresses of age conspired to damage the wooden penstock and weaken the concrete dam. In addition to ongoing maintenance, at times the penstock required major repairs, including a total rebuild in 1959. We're back now to what we call the Big Dip. This is the area where it washed out in February of 59. And the entire area was washed out in a matter of a few hours. We had 850 cubic feet a second of water flowing there. And it, just to my left is where the, it ended. So we had to build everything from the west end of the Big Dip up to this portion of pipe. In the fall of that year, the entire 30-year-old redwood penstock was replaced with one of Douglas fir. In the late 1960s, it was the dam that needed revamping. The reservoir was drained so that deteriorating concrete could be removed and replaced. By the early 1980s, the freeze-thaw cycle had again taken its toll on the dam's aging concrete, and core drilling revealed a number of internal cracks. To seal them, the downstream sides of the four arches were injected with epoxy adhesive, which slowed but didn't stop the leaks. In the late 1980s, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission said both the dam and the penstock were reaching the end of their life cycles and should be replaced. UPCO studied a number of options before adopting a multi-year plan to manage such complex and costly projects. In April of 1991, work began on a new roller-compacted concrete dam. Roller-compacted concrete differs from conventional concrete in the way it's mixed, transported, and placed. The product itself is a mixture of gravels, Portland cement, fly ash, and water. It looks like damp gravel and holds its shape with little or no formwork. It can also support people and equipment immediately after pouring. Eight months and nine million dollars later, the new dam was in place. The old and new dam stood side by side through the spring runoff of 1992. Then the old arches were cut below the water line and became a memory to all but the fish that claimed them as new habitat. Nearly a decade later, it was time to replace the now 40-year-old penstock. Its leaks were proliferating under the pressures of time and the elements. In many places, the standard practice of using wooden wedges to tighten the steel bands had become an exercise in futility. Advances in technology presented choices other than the wood or concrete available to the first builders, and after careful study, the company chose steel for the new penstock at a projected cost of $6 million. Early on the morning of July 9, 2001, water was diverted through the spill gates and into the old riverbed. At first, it was a tentative trickle, but the trickle became a torrent, cascading into the gorge as Victoria Falls. Then the headgate was lowered, shutting off the water to the old wooden penstock for the last time. As soon as the penstock was completely drained, the demolition contractor went to work. The old wood staves came down more quickly than they went up. There was no time to waste because the schedule allowed just 10 days for demolition before the civil contractor moved in to prepare the foundation corridor for the new penstock. Although the wrecking contractor had salvage rights to the wood and iron, he let employees at Victoria keep a 10-foot section as a tip of the hat to history. They poured a concrete slab and moved their penstock for posterity to a spot near the dam. During this time, sections of spiral welded steel pipe, nine and a half feet in diameter and up to 54 feet in length, began arriving from South Carolina, one to a truck, until they filled the staging area. Each of the 120 sections was numbered to ensure a good fit with its neighbors. The penstock would be built from both ends to meet in the middle. 
During the second week of August, boilermakers began maneuvering the first pieces into place. Plans called for it to be held in place by rock ballast and concrete thrust blocks. A backhoe shaped a trench in the ballast to cradle the sections of pipe. Wherever the penstock changed direction, thrust blocks were installed to resist any movement. Victoria wasn't generating electricity during the construction period, but distribution lines on the property brought energy from UPCO's other sources to serve the dam site and a handful of nearby residents. When construction activities came too close to the distribution lines on the property, UPCO personnel from Victoria and Ontonagon shut off the power or removed the lines. Because most of the construction activity took place below the dam, it was recreation as usual upstream. The reservoir's picturesque setting and relatively easy access make it a popular spot for outdoor enthusiasts. Sightings of resident wildlife only add to the enjoyment. Throughout the summer and fall of 2001, contractors worked steadily on what they called the Green Mile. Day in and day out, the routine continued, delivering sections of pipe, positioning and fitting them, welding, painting, testing. On a good day, they could place six lengths. By the end of November, the old wood stave penstock was history, and a tube of steel carried water to the powerhouse. The project was completed slightly ahead of schedule, and better yet, under budget at just over $5 million. As the winter of 2001-2002 settled over the Ontonagon River Valley, the waters of the south and west branches flowed quietly through the new penstock, did their work, then slipped back into the river to continue their journey to Lake Superior. With a new dam and penstock, Victoria Hydro celebrated her 71st birthday stronger and more vigorous than ever. The Spees brothers and Harry Price would be proud of their Victoria, after all these years still providing safe, clean, economical energy for the people and industries of Michigan's Upper Peninsula. <laughs>